you know, I lost everything. I lost my house. I lost two cars, two working vans. I went broke and everything. And so, and I got through it. It was awesome though, because I learned a lot to trust God that if you have a plenty or if you're in lack, he'll always take care of you. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Well, Brian, how you doing? I'm so good, yeah. I can't even put it into words. Yeah. How does that answer? I think that's the best answer you can give. <laughs> you know, when you think about, a lot of times you don't like to brag on uh, who you are as a person, but you really have a legacy and you really have a bio that's ex just extraordinary. Hit after hit, song after songs, and God is literally taking your talent around the world, right? Yeah, it's pretty crazy. You know, it's been 25 years since we jumped into the entertainment business, so. Yeah. I would never have predicted my life if for a million years. I would never. It's crazy. It is amazing. I don't know how I got here. Wow, it's amazing. Well, I'll tell you what. I want to show you how, you how you got here. We got a little clip <laughs> to show you about your okay. life. All right. Take, so take a look at this. You'll, you'll see what I'm talking about. This guy literally has an amazing bio. Watch this uh, clip. We'll be right back. At the age of 11, Brian Welch picked up a guitar and found his calling. Barely out of high school, he helped found the rock band Korn. The group became a Grammy award-winning, multi-platinum selling band and quickly soared to the top of the music world while selling 30 million records internationally. While with Korn, Brian won two Grammys and several MTV Music Video Awards. Then, in the prime of his career, Brian sent shockwaves through the music industry when he announced his resignation. While flourishing on the outside, a tumultuous battle of drugs and alcohol raged on the inside, ultimately leading to this new metal rock star surrendering his life to Christ. Like, where is your real location? Where is your real world? Where is your source? Where is your life? Where is your address? Your real address is with God. Combining the old with the new, he began using music and other ventures to share a message of hope with youth across the nation. Here on a new mission, Brian Welch. So Brian Head Welch is with us here today and he's talking to us about his amazing journey. Brian, let's go all the way back. I believe you're from, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I'm thinking Bakersfield, California, is that right? Bakersfield, California. Bakersfield. I actually was born in Hawthorne, California, right outside of LA. Okay. And my dad was a banker, my mom was a nurse. We lived in Torrance until I was in fourth grade, then we moved to Bakersfield. That's the, wow. all the way back. Now, how does a city like Bakersfield produce a rock star like Brian Welch? It's Buck Owens fault. Who's that? <laughs> Buck Owens is a famous country star. Of course, I knew that. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, my, you know, everybody was in the country when I was growing up. Okay. And I kind of, I kind of uh, followed footsteps and became a little country kid with a cowboy hat and boots for about three months during what? one summer. Okay, okay. And then I looked in the mirror and I was like, "What are you doing? <laughs> That's not you." And so I went straight metal. I went the opposite way. All right. Did, who taught you how to play guitar? Um, Where does that start? Actually, uh, I remember listening to, they had these eight tracks, boys and girls, back in the day. <laughs> and uh, they had these eight tracks and I put an eight track in and it played music. It's a box into another box and it played music. And uh, I, it was Queen, The Game, Another One Bites the Dust, that record. Okay. And uh, okay. yeah, I heard a drum fill. It was like, doo -doo 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 -doo. and I was like, Dad, I want to play drums. Okay. And he's like, well, you know how many pieces there are to a drum set? Do you want to carry those around everywhere? He talked, because he's thinking noise. Right, right. right. And he talked me into guitar. I started playing guitar. And uh, that was around 1980. Do you remember the first song you learned on the guitar? Uh, yeah, Smoke on the Water. Smoke on the Water. Deep Purple. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> I was going to say. And yeah. Uh, That's, uh, what's, the, what's the melody for that? What's the, what's the chord line? <laughs> So how old are you at this time? So I'm picturing a what, eight-year-old, a ten-year-old? Ten years old, ten years old, yeah. Ten-year-old, you're playing that, and your parents are thinking what? Be um, quiet? No, oh, he'll put it down next week. <laughs> he'll be like over it, you know? Uh -huh. Little did they know. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't. So what keeps you going here again in Bakersfield playing at ten years old? Uh, the good Because it's always amazing when I meet somebody like yourself, 
you you don't necessarily come from a family of musicians or a family like your mom or dad they don't play right so it's just you no i was in church with them not too long ago and i was wondering what key my dad was singing the worship songs <laughs> in i'm like so i don't know they can't sing in key my brother no it's just uh something that i think it was a gift because i got i had I had some issues growing up, getting bullied, and I, I went through depression like pretty early. Early in life. Yeah, uh, you know, probably fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth grade in those years. Okay. I just, uh, I remember looking in the mirror and not liking myself. Wow. Because, probably because I got picked on, and um, girls, you know, I wasn't, I remember the first girl, her name was Keely, and <laughs> I asked her, will you go study with me? Because I thought that's what it was, not you mean steady. steady or so. But I said study. <laughs> just, okay, I okay. thought that you go with a girl and you study your schoolwork after school and she's your girlfriend. <laughs> and she said, no. <laughs> and rejection issues right then. So I was like, I, you know what's crazy? It's funny things can, can set you on right. the course in your life that's right. negative. And I, I was like, oh, I'm ugly and I'm this and that. And I carried these thoughts in my head. So. Yeah, they say depression usually comes in in some weird or unique way that most of the time the person don't even know how it started. So, right. Yeah. Not that we're psychologists or anything, but right. <laughs> but <laughs> all right. So let's talk about uh, the 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 band Corn. That starts in Bakersfield, or no? No, we all grew up together in Bakersfield. Okay. But the band actually started in Huntington Beach, California. I met the bass player in uh, junior high, seventh grade. He was in the Duran Duran. I was into Iron Maiden and Ozzy. <laughs> and I told him, "You need to get into metal, bro." And so. <laughs> It worked, and uh, I met the guitar guitar player Monkey in the ninth grade. I met uh, the singer fourth grade actually. He went to okay, the, and um, so yeah, we we but we ended up when we graduate from high school, you're in the armpit of California, Bakersfield, right? You got to say it. I didn't say it. You got to get out of there. Yeah. So we come, we all come to L.A. And through other circumstances, we ended up forming Corn in uh, around '93. Under who, who comes up with the genre of, of of heavy metal? Like why heavy metal and not pop rock or R&B or something else? You know, um, just that uh, we were all drawn to it growing up. You know, um, all of us just had that in common, and mm -hmm. it was it was something that I just loved the sound. I loved the the vocals. I loved the guitar, and um, and so did the guys too. Yeah. And so we just gravitated towards each other. Was it big then? Like, because we were talking about early 90s or w around what time? Probably, uh, I mean, from, from when I got into it, it was early 80s okay. to the early 90s. So that decade right there. Was, was, was heavy metal uh, coming into its own at that time? Was it a I big genre? So. You know, Black Sabbath got it going okay. uh, um, in, uh, in the 70s or. And then it trans over, and then Ozzy went solo, and that was huge for me because I was a huge Ozzy fan. Okay. Blizzard of Oz, Dire, D Blizzard of Oz, Diary of a Madman, and uh, and then other bands started coming out, um, like Iron Maiden, and so all these bands were really big back then. So mm -hmm. it, it had a had a good following. You're, you're thinking what at the time? This is just great music that I love. We're gonna play it and uh, just have fun, or you're thinking we're gonna be big. We're gonna we're gonna sell a lot of. Albums? What are you thinking? Are I'm you thinking having fun or what? This is gonna be what I want to do for the rest of my life, and I gotta get in there somehow. Wow. That's what I'm thinking because right. I had no other uh, plan actually. No other plan. You, are you are you thinking you're gonna be rich doing this, or are you thinking I'm just gonna have fun doing it? Well, I'm the guy that's just like, look, if I can make a living, I don't need to be rich. I just want to do music. You know, not being too greedy or whatever. You know. When do you start writing? Or do you write? I start writing songs around 12 years old, 13 years old. I'm writing, um, you know, little cheesy songs. Uh, Don't You Know was one, and it was just like this. It's kind of like, uh, not glam metal, but kind of like that really melodic, you know. And, uh -huh. uh, and so but the lyrics were totally cheesy. And, but at least I was... I do you was, remember the lyrics? Yeah. What, what, what? <laughs> For the first time. <laughs> You're gonna make me play him. Of course. For the, for, for the first time ever on national TV, the lyrics to Brian Head Welch's first song. Go. I'm not singing it, but it, well, was, <laughs> it was Don't You Know, Don't You Know How Much I Want You. Do You Want Me Baby? Not Knowing is Driving Me Crazy. 
<laughs> deep. Very deep. Very deep. Beautiful. I love it, man. Maybe you'll do a remix of it at some point. Did you point. write a song when you were a kid? I did. You got a good But this interview now. is about you. <laughs> you said I could ask you questions. I don't know my first song. Uh, all right. So what I want to ask you, I want to ask you uh, about who came up with the name Corn, because it's spelled with a K. Where does this come from? <clears throat> we were underneath that Huntington Beach Pier. We were, you know, going towards the wrong way of living, right? Mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're underneath there. We're drinking 40 ounces. And uh, our singer just said, what about, we were like, what are we going to call ourselves? What are we going to call ourselves? And he said, what about Corn? And there was some like horror movie, Children of the Corn or something. He's like, oh, we yeah. could, he's like, we could we could write it with a K, and put the R backwards because Toys R Us had that yeah. backwards R. <laughs> and, uh... So so the big heavy metal hard rock band got their R from Toys R Us. Look, look, we had we had uh, branding like expertise, all right? Exactly. So, no, but we're thinking, so, so our, his lyrics, our singer's lyrics was, a lot of it was about growing up and childhood trauma and stuff. So he was okay. like thinking, you know, what if a kid tried to spell corn and wrote it, like misspelled it, and put the R backwards, okay. like Toys R Us, and some of his lyrics went, so he was just going with that childhood thing. I like know? it. So that's how it came. So that's how it came about. Mm -hmm. All right, so... This is going to be like a little bit of a weird question, but you know, I'm, when, when you think of like a typical song in church or whatever, uh, some of you may or may not, you think melody, verse, chorus, bridge, vamp, or something like that. A heavy metal song, uh, do, do they have the same embodiment? Or because it seems like it's it's a little bit of uh, a little different. In structure. You calling it the music I, I, a little messy? <laughs> I'm not calling it nothing. I'm asking you. <laughs> no, it's a... It's yeah, so been, what's the structure of a heavy metal song? So when I was growing up, it was like, uh, you know, the opening up the main riff, and then you go into the verse, and then the big hook chorus, okay. and then the guitar player goes in solos, and, you know, for like a minute or two minutes, and then you come back into the chorus, and then out. Got so it. it's, it's similar, yeah. Similar. But then when Korn got together, we didn't do solos. We just, we figured, let's make up, uh, let's, let's write a whole new bridge section instead of one guy soloing, we'll just do a bridge section and come up with a cool piece of music there instead. And okay. so we started doing that. So you guys do this band and you end up, I read somewhere, uh, selling uh, platinum, I mean, just a ton of, of CDs. Close, close to 40 million, yeah. 40 million CDs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Pretty crazy. Not bad, right? Not too shabby. Not too shabby. <laughs> One time I read somewhere when you, I don't know which album, maybe you could tell me which album this was, but when the album came out, it hit number one on the Billboard charts, and I'm talking not just heavy metal, but across the board. Like, I think Dr. Dre had come out with something that same week, and Celine Dion, of all people, came out with something that week, but Korn actually topped all those. Yeah, it was surreal. Albums. It was surreal. We, uh, and we loved some Dre back then, too. <laughs> You know, and just, we love Dre, we love, I actually, I'll say it now that I'm older, but I would, I would even listen to some, my heart goes on, yeah, some, yeah, Selena Selena Dion. Dion. yeah, yeah. but I'm like, we passed him, what? Wow. I never call my dad, because my dad was the one saying, hey, get a backup plan, I know you want to be a heavy metal star and everything, but, wow. so just to call him, say, dad, we are number one this you week. You gotta worry about just, the backup. He's just going, how did this happen? <laughs> Congratulations, <laughs> son, you know. So you really, probably cool. thought it was a, you probably thought somebody was pulling the joke or something, right? Yeah, our our bass player Fieldy always said, "Man, it felt like someone was punking us." Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know? Like someone's gonna come out just joking, <laughs> you know. So, what does it feel like to get all the way there and to experience that? And then, uh, how does experiencing such success can put you in such a uh, a very low place? You know, because I know that during that time is when. Uh, the, the drugs and the depression and all that stuff. So talk about that a little bit. Or yeah, it was a, you know, you just got to be careful what you wish for, and then when you when you get what you wish for, you got to make sure your foundation is in order, right? So you don't, you know, just ruin everything. But um, the drugs were. I remember I actually tried marijuana when I was like eight years old, 
one of my friends had an older brother and he had an ashtray and he had some things in there. Wow. And we tried to smoke it. I didn't, I didn't get high or nothing, but then I tried smoking in 13 and I got so high off one time trying it that I sat in a chair for like five hours and, and, wow. I, and it seemed like two minutes. Wow. And so I was like, that's not fun. I just lost five hours of my life. I'm never doing it again. <laughs> and so, and then when we first started corn, we had some guys that we were hanging out with. They were helping us like get the get the band going, and uh, they were they were doing some harder drugs like meth, and uh, and so they were trying to keep it from us. They were, you know they weren't pushing you know, it pushing it at all. Right, right. But I had tried it with some of my close friends once, and so I got, I just got really drunk one night, and I was like, hey man, I need to. I'm, I'm spinning. I need to sober up. And yeah. he's like, well, I got something that can, you know. Right. And so and it starts the journey. Yeah. There are seasons in your life that got extremely heavy uh, with the addiction uh, to drugs. Let's talk about that. How did, I, I know how it started. We just talked about that. But how does it become uh, what I would say an addiction and, and almost starts controlling uh, your life, if you, if you will? Oh, man. You know, it's the same old story. You you think that you can control it, you know, and you're like, oh, I'm not going to turn into one of those people. Yeah. You know, and so I I don't know how I convinced myself that I could be a recreational meth user, but I did. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm like just doing it once in a while when the corn was starting. But one good thing that happened was when corn started hitting the road, a few, like three of us were doing meth mm -hmm. before we got, we started touring and once we hit the road everyone's like man we got to get off this stuff we got to we got to get to work we got to go out there and so you knew it was a problem oh yeah because yeah. that's a hard drug man yeah and um and so we went on the road and we're like okay we'll just do coke <laughs> and, you know the the mind right you know, and so I wasn't trying to do coke out there, but it was just like, okay, at least you could sleep on that. And we wouldn't do it all the time, but it was mainly just beer, drinking beer and everything. And, but it was everywhere, man, the drugs and the, and it's, I just never thought about that when I was 10 years old, listening to Ozzy and all that. I wasn't like, I'm going to go on the road and there's going to be hard drugs everywhere and it's going to be a temptation and there's going to be free alcohol and Jägermeister endorsements. I never wow. thought about that. I wow. thought about the music. Right, exactly. If I'm hearing you correctly, most so when you deal with a, an, an addictive drug, maybe most people are not thinking this is a necessarily bad thing. This is just something I can control. That's the illusion. I right, guess. that's the illusion. That, and, that uh, it's not going to... That was us anyway. Like, we didn't want to go destroy our lives. We just wanted to have... A little fun, you know. Right, right. And so, but year after year, it would progressively get worse. So it's a slow progression. It's not something where people think somebody's just overnight an addict. It's right. something that you kind of. Yeah. Right? How do you know when you're, or when would you say it was uh, uh, out of control? Um, or did you even know? I mean, <laughs> It was like it was out of control pretty much from the beginning, but we would we would step back. Like I said, we would go, okay. So to sh show myself and us that we're not addicts, we won't do it for a few months, mm -hmm. and then we'll come back and do it. But it started getting out of control, um, probably around two. I remember 2001. I was getting a little scared. My wife ended up leaving me. She was hooked on meth, and uh, we were, we were using me and her. We had the baby, and we we want to be good parents, but we would use like just once in a while. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I left for tour one day, um, I noticed about a month into the tour that she had went into everyday like addiction habit pretty much. And so she left me and, uh, and our, our child and she didn't want to leave her baby. She did not want to, but she was afraid of my big, uh, you know, all the lawyers I had and everything. And sh she was like, I'm never going to win. So why even try? So she loved her kid and loves her daughter very much to this day. But um, so... So when I, uh, I got full custody of my daughter, I got clean, then 9-11 happened, and I got all stressed out and uh, started drinking again. Mm. And then by that time, I moved back to Bakersfield, California, the armpit. Mm. But <laughs> by this time, it was, it was booming, right. and it was more like modern and everything. So I like Bakersfield now, but uh, I moved back there, and I, I uh, ran into someone that was a friend that was very successful. He had all kinds of employees, and he just so happened to dibble dabble in meth sometimes because his employees would do it. And then he was like running the business, but 
you know, he thought he had it under control too. I'll just do right. it once in a while. And, right. and then, I, so I got some, I found out one of his employees' uh, number. I got the, his cell number and then I had to connect. And then I had a corn tour, it was with Lincoln Park and uh, it was a full summer tour, Lincoln Park, Snoop Dogg, Corn, and some other bands. And uh, I got so scared because I went on my first week long or two week long binge of crystal meth where I slept, but I kept using every day. Wow. And so I didn't have time to stop. And I was so scared and I was like, man, I'm gonna have to take the, because when you stop meth, if you're doing it for a long time, you gotta crash for like a week or two. Like you just sleep and eat sugar and then go back to sleep. And so I was like, I, I don't have time to do that. So I, I bought like a couple of uh, eight balls of meth and took them on the tour all summer. Wow. And that was, my, that was the worst. I saw, I saw somewhere in the movie where your parents said they didn't even, your mom said in hindsight 2020, she realized all the signs. But at the time she didn't even know or they weren't even aware uh, that you were uh, that addicted to, to meth and on drugs. Right. I would play it off, I look successful. Yeah. You got probably a couple different types of addicts. It's the functioning addict and the non-functioning addict. That's just, you know, and I was a pretty high functioning addict. I could do all kinds of things. And, and um, you know, I, I played my parts yeah. with the band. I was just socially recluse. Yeah. At some point, Brian, in the midst of all of this uh, crazy, what some people would uh, call a successful life, Somebody introduces you uh, to the message of Christ. Somebody introduces you to yeah. the Bible because you didn't grow up in it, right? No. Okay. So, at what age, or give us, you know, that experience? How, how how did you have that encounter? Well, it was I was the type of guy that you know um, would flip through the channels and be like, land on TBN or a Christian channel and be like, you know. And, who knows what I said back then, right. but just, you know, mocked it or whatever. And then, you know, fast forward years and years later, um, I got to this point where I was on that two year binge, right? And I wanted to get clean. I had talked to a couple uh, um, outpatient rehab places, one in Bakersfield and one in Hollywood. And they both were telling me, we don't, we don't have as much success with meth addicts as we do with other drug addicts. And I'm just like going, wow. So what are you telling me? What can you do for me? And they're like, well, we can try, you know, I'm just, we just have to be honest with you and you can do it. You can, you know, if you, if you set your, but I wasn't given like a lot of hope, you know, and uh, so I was just thinking like, I gotta, cause by that time I was like, I, I do not want to exist anymore. Mm. I'm a, I'm a shell walking around with nothing of substance inside. And I got all kinds of money in the bank but I just don't want to wake up when I go to sleep. I just wish that I could just stay asleep. And wow. you know, and the only thing that made me want to breathe and, and live was my daughter. So I'm thinking, I just need to get off the drugs and so I could just be the best person I could be for her. Mm -hmm. But then I would have the thoughts when I get back on the drugs or, or do another line and that would wear off, I would think, man, she'd better off without me. Mm. And I'd start going through the suicidal uh, the thoughts and everything. And so. So it was a tug of war, but um, I told you that I was a functioning drug addict. I had these partners that were um, doing real estate deals. They were buying land and developing, and I became a partner with them. And uh, money was like my thing. I never liked to spend it. I always liked to make it grow. That was my thing before. And so these guys were growing their money, and right. so I blended right with them. And so I was attracted to them, and their business through that, and they actually were Christians. Wow. So God was using my money <laughs> idol, if you will. Right. And so I- uh, Pulling you in. Yeah, and so I did a business deal with them. We bought some land, and, and they were, I was just, they, you could tell, man, I was on meth, you know? And anybody could tell something was a little off, you know? Right. And so they ended up just talking to me, and they invited me to go to church one day, and I'm like, you know, I, I used to mock it when I was growing up, and, uh, but I did ask Christ in my heart when I was 12 through some neighbors. But uh, so I held on to that, and when they asked me to come to church, I'm like, oh. you know, all I was thinking was like Ned Flanders from The Simpsons, you know? And it's like, <laughs> I'm like, okay, they're not, they're not 
kind of like I am, but they're not the same type of person I am, but maybe they're probably sober. So if I go there, it'll be like a community of sober people. I okay. thought Christians just didn't party. You know, that's okay. what I thought. And then I get there and I hear about this, this Jesus Christ who's real, the son of God who was here and, you know, died on the cross and, and raised from the dead and came and uh, would come to live inside of me. So, but I'm, I'm, I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around. I'm like, so this guy came and walked on the earth in a robe and did miracles and then went on, died on the cross and then raised back to life. And now he's going to come live inside of me. I'm like, how does that happen? <laughs> you know? And, uh, but you know, you could feel the presence and everything at that church, what they took me to. And I'm like, man, these people are either crazy or they have the meaning of life. And I started thinking back when I asked Christ in my heart and I'm like, maybe that was where my journey went the wrong way. Yeah. You know, maybe that's why, sure, I got money and success and fame and every, everything, but I don't know who I am. Maybe that's where I, I went off track. Mm. And so I was just like, I raised my hand and I went home and I started praying to God like I had been a Christian for 20 years. I was wow. desperate. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Beautiful, right? Beautiful. When you have this experience, and when you have this re-encounter, if you will, with the Lord, uh, is it a gradual turnaround or is it an overnight uh, turnaround as far as your addiction and your lifestyle at that point? It was pretty overnight when I think about, you know, it was just a, a couple weeks, three weeks or something. But I did, I, man, the pastor was so cool there. He was, he just talked about, like, he was in jeans and a, a regular shirt. He didn't look like holier than now. And he just said, look, man, you, if you're on drugs, if you're messed up, if you're, you have a, a bad marriage, you're alcoholic, you come, come to church while you're messed up. Yeah. Bring all your garbage here yeah. and, and God will come in and clean you out. Yeah. You know? So he was, it was like non-judgmental, yeah. non-judgmental. And, uh, so I kept going. I kept going. I was high on meth going to church, you know, and I'm like, I would tell God, like, I, you know, I want to get off this stuff. You know, my daughter deserves a better father and I want to be what she deserves. We don't, because we don't have all the time in the world to really kind of get into a lot of stuff, but that's why you've got to check the movie out, uh, Loud Crazy Love. But in the film, uh, I, we get a chance to experience uh, that whole process of, of God coming into your life, you getting radically saved and then you changing, thinking, uh, I need to get out of corn, I need to get uh, away from all of the music stuff, and then somewhere in the, I don't wanna give too much uh, away or try to tell your testimony, but at some point you end up uh, uh, going broke, and it still doesn't quite put your relationship with your daughter back together. There's a whole, whole little process there that's going on. I know I'm not doing it justice because there's a lot, but just talk about for a little bit how that after you got saved and how you got radically saved, you start this journey that you think is going to make everything better, but it doesn't quite go that way. Talk about that just a little bit. Yeah, so I met, I met Christ. His, you know, he's, he's the light of the world. He became a man, but like his spirit, his light came into me and I knew he was real. And I, had, I was pretty, I had some intimate encounters like right away. Mm -hmm. And so I was just instantly addicted to that relationship. It was like all in. And so the first year was like amazing. I'm going to be the best dad I could be. Um, it was focused on Christ and my daughter. That was it. And uh, I wanted to learn this life, you know, get to know how to walk with them. And I was hoping for a, um, a quick healing, you know. Yeah. And then the old issues started coming back up. And, uh, you know, there was, there was a lot of uh, conversations that I had with God about, you know, him taking his time and healing me, you know. And... But then I was you're feel, thinking it's going to be. Yeah. Yeah. And then yeah. I was like, but OK, then I would come back to my senses and be like, I did this damage to myself. Um, why, why am I mad at you? But then I would meet someone at some church or something. They'd be like, yeah, I was just instantly my anger's gone. Right. When, and I'm like, you're like what what's happening? <laughs> what right, right. Like, what's you know? up? <laughs> and I'm, I got holes in my walls. Yeah. You know? And so I went through all that. My daughter grew up and it was fine. I was. She saw some things. I dealt with anger and rage while a Christian, you know, as a Christian. She saw some things that she shouldn't have, and but we had some great times as well. But she turns like, you know, early teens. Her mom's still not in her life really a little bit, but not much. And so all these issues with her start coming to the surface. And, you know, I lost everything. I lost 
my house. I lost two cars, two working vans. I went broke wow. and everything. And so, and I got through it. It was awesome though, because I learned a lot to trust God that if you have plenty or if you're in lack, he'll always take care of you. Yeah. It doesn't matter. So it was good. But how I lost it was hard. My daughter even saw it. You know, I got, I got ripped off by some people and they were supposedly Christians and she's like seeing this. She's like, I don't want to be a Christian. Right. What are all these people doing to my dad? They're saying, can't be a Christian and have tattoos and people are just judging me. Mm. She's like, I don't want nothing to do with this. And so she starts going through depression too. You, you pick up right where you left off, but I just want to jump in right quick. What, what, what do you say? Because it seems to me like a lot of times people don't want to come to Christ or they don't want to come to church. They don't want to watch a show like this or watch this channel for a lot of these uh, reasons that you're talking about. Uh, that, you know, you go broke if you become a Christian or it's, or it's not, you know, or somebody wants your money or it's somebody else's that's just after you. What do you say to people that, you know, because you've been on both sides of the wall. What do you say that kind of not necessarily kills that argument, but just kind of brings light to what's truly going on here when, in, when you talk about relationship with the Lord? I just feel like, man, people, if you're going to let man chase you away from God, from their mistakes, then... After your life's over, you're going to really regret that because it's like, that's why Jesus says, uh, forgive 99 times. I mean, you're the, seven, you're the preacher. Se seven times so, 70. Oh, yeah. that's 99 is a sheep, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. See, goes, I'm still goes, learning. Goes after the one. That's I'm great. I'm still learning. Great. <laughs> seven times seven or whatever. Seven, seven times seven. Yeah. So that's a lot of forgiveness. Jesus says forgive over and over basically yeah. because people are screwed up. Christians. Oh. Well, give me patience for a lot of Christians out there. Well, too, because you, you know, said because in the movie, I thought I had to get, I had to fix myself first, get off drugs, alpha meth, then go to church. I, I thought I saw that in the movie where you said something like that, and that's why you didn't go to church at first. You thought you had to fix yourself first. Right. Yeah. I but, thought if I walk into church, I blow up like a, <laughs> you know, because God will judge me. You know, right. he'll, he'll like splat me because I'm on meth in his house or whatever. Right. You know, you have all these pre. pre preconceived ideas. And what I think is so interesting, interesting about your story, Brian, is that you, you don't fall one time. It's a, it's a journey. And, and, and you are saying today that God still accepts you with your journey or with your process. Is that, is that what you're saying? I, I feel like he loves failure so much. He loves the biggest messes, man, because that's, that's where he shines, you know? Yeah. He's so good. You're now back with the band Corn. You play, you guys still rock it out, but you do something different now. Uh, there's an opportunity for ministry. Talk about that a little bit or how that happens. I call it just loving on the fans, you know. And uh, so back in the day, we had these big old bodyguards, right? And we, we treated women like objects. And we would go, say, after show pass. They had a boyfriend, they had to leave them if they came backstage and all wow. this stuff. And so, so we're older, mature, people are remarried and got their heads on straight. So now I got friends all over the world and I give them backstage, or I guess not backstage passes, but like little VIP, separate, yeah, VIP little area passes. Mm -hmm. And I go gather like, you know, 20, 30, you know, people. And I just go and I tell them my story. Mm -hmm. And I, tell, I talk about the life, I talk about the who I was, who I am now, and I pray for them, wow. and, uh, and just tell them the truth, man, and that's S it. Let me make sure I understand you correctly. At, at, yeah, that's good. <laughs> Beautiful. At a rock concert, at a, at a heavy metal concert, at some point there are people out there that are gathering people to bring to the side that after the show, you're gonna go and pray with and talk to. Yeah, all the time, we do it all the time. Some people call me the Jesus freak of corn and some people, you know, everyone's different in corn to do their own thing. This yeah. is what I do and yeah. everyone respects it and they're just like, man, you be you, God. you be you. God. And, and it's, I, really, I really appreciate my band members for letting me just be who I am. In a minute, we're gonna go down here and talk amongst y'all, so y'all get ready, don't be scared, okay? <laughs> all right. So. So for you, man, you kind of fall in that middle lane that you probably catch it from the religious side as well as the, I would imagine, the uh, uh, unreligious side, right? Because yep. you can't be preaching at no, you can't be playing at no corn and talk about you're a Christian and then 
you know, you can't, you know, we don't believe in this Jesus thing that you're So you catch it from both ends, right? I just, man, remember that rejection I had when I was a kid? Man, I get rejection on both sides now, too. It's like, yeah. what are you joking me? But, you know, I'm just, look, I just focus on me and my journey with the Lord. And my, my, my strength Come is on. that relationship. Come on, bro. You know? It's what? So, the relationship. the relationship. That's my strength. Yeah. So yeah. they could persecute me on this side yeah. and I'm going to love them. They could persecute me on this side and I'm going to love them too. Yeah. And I'm just going to focus on the relationship because when I get battle wounded and emotionally scarred from people sometimes, oh. the Lord will just Because that can happen in church, strength. right? Oh, yeah, yeah man. Christians are brutal sometimes. Bro. <laughs> you know it. You know it. Brian, come on. We're all broken, though. We I don't are, blame them. We are. Come on. Come on. We're going we're gonna to step down here. Let's, okay. We're going to come down here amongst y'all. Y'all ready? Yeah. All right. Come on. Yeah. This movie, Loud Crazy Love. Let's talk about it real quick. Is it out? When does it come out? How it's can I find now. it? It's out now. And okay. um, it's on Amazon, iTunes, everything. And it was on Showtime for a limited run. Mm -hmm. Now it's out wide. So. Nationwide. Yeah. All right. Uh, just by a show of hands, how many of you have ever dealt with or know anybody that's dealing with uh, addiction or depression or anything? Yeah. 90%. 90%. Right? Yeah, it's a, it's a very high number. I don't think people realize how much Christian folks, these are Christian people, these are, these are uh, folks that love the Lord that are still battling and dealing with this type of, uh, type of yeah. thing, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's amazing. What can we say to these guys here tonight? Let's talk to some people here tonight. What, what do you say to somebody here tonight that is battling or dealing with some type of addiction or substance abuse? What is the first thing that you usually share? Don't ever quit. No matter how many times you fall, you keep going to the Lord. Yeah. Don't yeah. quit on God, you know? Come on. Because one day, one day, you're, one, one time you're going to be, you're going to get up and you're going to stay up. That's it, you know, and it's, and it's real. And God, God is very real yeah. and he's going to, he, he, he takes his spirit and his spirit is pure love and he pours it into your soul and you get satisfied with that. And there's no other, there's no better high than that. Hmm. And that's why you lose the addiction, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah it's amazing. What do you say to people that feel like they cannot, you know, it's great that I know there's some great churches represented here tonight. And obviously, whoever introduced you to Christ, you went, thank God, to a good church and somebody that was dressed and looked uh, normal enough to where you felt comfortable. To somebody that's watching the program and they're in a community or a city where they, there is not that church or place that they can feel comfortable uh, how can they get to a place where they can be true to, or be honest to say, hey, listen, this is who I, this is really what I'm dealing with. Like, like you even got women that are, you know, married and got children and whatnot and still feel like there's something missing. There's, there's an insecurity, there's a depression or oppression. How do you get them to the place to where, or what do you say to get them to be honest about it first and to be transparent? Is there a way? Yeah, I think so. I think I think in every city or town or most, you know, that there is a, a church that has uh, pure hearts and they'll be able to you can take any junk that you have and talk to them about it. And um, and if not, you know, you can find someone on Facebook and meet at Starbucks or something, you know, just don't don't talk yourself out of it. Yeah. You know, oh, I can't do that. Those people will judge me. There's always someone somewhere, somewhere that you can connect with. But people give up too easy in yeah. life. You know, yeah. they give up. Yeah. yeah. Why? Why give up? There's there's a victory over, you know, just past this one time that you try, you're gonna get to this place, and your whole life is can change forever, man. Yeah. And yeah. so let's talk to the church right quick, just real quick. Don't go too hard on them, but just just. I love the church, man. <laughs> I know you do. I'm messing with you. I, but, but take a quick minute, take a quick minute to help uh, those of us that are on the other side of this thing. They, we've never dealt with addiction or we've never dealt with nothing. How can we do better? What, what would you say to the pastors around? Here's your chance to speak to the pastors around the world. Pastor, here's something you could say from your pulpit that will help those that are in the shadows of your city that may want to come and, and hear the message of Christ. And I will give it back to the to the guy that was. A, a just a, he was the preacher, but he was just a, a normal guy. And he was like, man, bring your mess here. And it's okay that, we ha that you're a mess in this place. In my church, it's okay that you're a mess. We're never going to give up on you because God will never give up, you know. And, so, and you can't, like, uh, give someone the behavioral, behavioral 
um, steps to be like Christ-like. He's got to have time to pour his spirit in yeah. and do a supernatural work inside of him. Yeah. And we can't, you got, that takes time. Come on, brother. You got to be patient. And I'm talking to myself too, yeah. you yeah. know, because it's just, it's, it's a work that God wants to do. And it's not, it's not fast food, you know, it's like, it takes, it takes a minute, you know. Be patient with the process. Yeah. So the church is all about a process. And I think that the world that judges us sometimes need to be mindful of that because they judge us very hard. Yeah. But then the church itself too has to be careful not to judge the world and those that are coming in. So what I hear today more than anything with your message and even the message of loud, crazy love is that with God, it's all about the process and the patience of that process. Yeah. And it brings about so the good. promise. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, I, I'm, I'm a big, just a point of not making it us and them like the world oh good. that's them that's it's like we're all broken humans the only thing is is that us that are believe in christ and he's inside of us and we're letting him get all our junk out and sometimes you see that mess out there but you know i just i think everybody is just the same we're all broken you know yeah. did you think you were gonna make it um just through the addiction and everything um I didn't think I was going to make it out. And if I did think I was going to make it out of the addiction, I thought I would just carry that depression for the rest of my life and I would just have to bare knuckle it. And Christ has taken away my depression. He's given me, I'm a new creation, you know, a brand new creation. Can I say one thing? I am a new creation and he's taken that and he's given me so much hope, but I, I'm going to be honest, like I do take non-narcotic, um, mild depression medication and I always, and I, I got off it for a while and, and I just, I needed to get back on it. And so that there's no shame in that either. Good. Whatever works for you, you know, yeah. 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 for the depression, yeah, for the mild depression, not right. a lot. Just, uh, yeah. We just did a uh, we just did a seminar at our church now church down in Hollywood and it was just for mental uh, health wellness because yeah. I think it's a subject that we don't talk about enough in church and part of that is bi you know bipolar and, and other things that even as a Christian you will deal with and so I thank you for being transparent about yeah. that and honest about that well I'll tell you I think our time is just about up here's what I would like to do I would just like to go out with you praying over all of these folks that are here today. Uh, if you're here today and you currently are being challenged in this area of addiction, I want you to stand to your feet real quick all over the, don't be embarrassed at all, just stand to your feet. Yep. And if you're at home, I want you to take a stand as well. And Brian, I want you to just pray over everyone here right now. Awesome, awesome. Thank you. All right. Well, uh, Lord, I thank you that your word says no eye has seen, yeah. no ear has heard, yeah. no mind has conceived the wonderful things that you have prepared for those that love you. Thank you and so when we read that, Lord, it feels like you're like it's saying, oh, but we have to wait until the next life. But the next verse says, but you have revealed it to us by your spirit. And so that's the whole issue right there. The spirit comes in to people's lives and takes and does the work inside. And it's not always a quick work. It's not always um, a joyful work. Sometimes it, you know, it's a good balance, but I thank you that your spirit is real. Your yeah. spirit is love. Your spirit is true life. And I ask you right now. Thank you. Lord. And I ask you, Holy Spirit, to come and pour into everybody here, Lord, that you would just remove the addictions. Thank you, God. By replacing the true true addiction, which is the pure love of God. There's nothing wrong with being addicted to the pure love of God. So, and, and grace, Lord, grace, grace is actually a power. The spirit of grace is actually a power that comes inside of us and allows us to live this life that Christ wants to live through us. So I ask you for that spirit of grace to come pour into every person here, into families that have addictive, um, friends or relatives or whatever give them that same spirit just help us all we're broken lord we need the power of your spirit to come and fix us so we trust that you will do that thank you in jesus name
EBN, our mission is to use every available means to reach as many individuals and families as possible with the life-changing gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you for helping make the gospel of grace go around the world. Without you, we couldn't do it. God bless you.